So reconnaissance is not the only mission set that these guys are given. We had mentioned, you know, I had mentioned earlier that among the other numerous mission sets they have, they've also been given the task of capturing enemy soldiers for intelligence gathering purposes. And just to stress a few things, because I think, I think it's hard to understand how difficult something like that really is unless you've been in a gunfight. You're not controlling anything after after that bullet leaves the end of your barrel. Like, yeah, I mean, I could be an accurate shot. I know I can hit you, but what if it goes through you and hits somebody else? Or I can shoot you in the leg. What if I hit your femoral artery? Or what if I hit one of the arm arteries in your arms? You know, like there's so many there's so many little things, pinpoint accuracies um, that that you just are outside of your control. So to think oh, well, we'll just pop this guy in the leg, grab him and go. It doesn't work like that. You know, it, it, it doesn't work like that. And and to be able to control an ambush to the point to where you can kill everybody else there but save one guy, keep him alive, and then take him alive and then extract him all the way back out of Laos to South Vietnam so he can be interrogated by, you know, the intelligence section of Mac Vsog, uh, that is an incredible incredibly difficult mission yeah i don't think he's gonna walk nicely he's not with gonna be you. he's not gonna be happy about it no you know, he's not gonna want to go willingly or quietly and uh sounds nuts. and getting him getting him alone i mean i you know you think think about you and i there was no way i was going to be captured mm -mm. not happening right and i don't think that opinion is unique to just our era right you know Nobody i mean i that. i'm sure that there's different motivations for us um than those guys but you know they don't want to be captured either you know I'm going to uh, take us along a, a journey with a guy named John Plaster. Now, John Plaster, right. um, he spent three years total with SOG, and he's written numerous books since, he's, you know, since his career ended. The guy is amazing. His books are amazing. Um, he Actually, my favorite book on this subject is, is one that he wrote, and uh, I highly recommend it. It's SOG. Um, uh, I'm not going to think of the name of the book now, but we will put it in the description. I think I want to say um, SOG, uh, America's Secret Commandos during the Vietnam War, something like that. It, it, it's it's a it's a phenomenal book. It, it I've listened to it. I have I have the the actual book and the audio book. I've probably listened to it three times now. I mean, it's mind blowing. Nice. And um, anyways, needless to say, he uh, he completed 22 recon missions in his time with SOG, and one of those missions is actually one of the most successful SOG missions on, on record, and it's uh, 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 the capture of an enemy soldier. Higher command from MACV SOG at this time, they, like I mentioned before, the B-52 bombing runs. One campaign had just ended, and now they needed targets for the next bombing campaign they wanted to run. Well, to do that, they wanted to be able to know, you know, truck, uh, truck parks, caches, encampments, all that stuff along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they needed a, a detailed outline of where those were located. Yeah. Well, the head shed of Mac V. Sog determined that the best way to get that information is capturing the lead driver of an NVA convoy, right? The lead driver, one, is one of the two easiest guys to capture in that convoy, either the lead driver or the rear driver, because mm -hmm. uh, you definitely don't want to try to capture someone out of the middle of a convoy. No. Um, He's also going to know the route. He's going to know all the stops. A thing that was unique about the NVA at this time, even their bicycle porters, they would be assigned a stretch of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So it's not like they would be given a, a, a packet or, you know, um, uh, supplies and be you know, told, all right, take this all the way to South Vietnam. Oh, they would like a uh, relay runner, almost. like a relay runner. Yeah. Like okay. uh, they, they would they would have their section of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that they were responsible for. They would collect a package, that someone that brought it down, or, or supplies from someone that brought it further down, hand it off to them. They'd turn around, they'd ride their route, hand it off to the next guy, and then turn around and go back. So they knew their section of, of Ho Chi Minh Trail, like the back of their hand. Well, all that taken into account, SOG realizes, hey, we need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> we need one of those. We need one of those lead truck drivers. So they turned to John Plaster for this. Um it's not an easy mission, right? You, you got to think the Ho Chi Minh Trail is heavily patrolled by the NVA, heavily patrolled. Not to mention, you know, you got the the troop movements going on on the road, but 
the security around the Ho Chi Minh Trail is is uh, I mean, there's not too many places within North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia that are as heavily defended as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And there are other challenges. We, we talked about the difficulties of capturing uh, a live enemy combatant and then extracting them. This mission he's going on is titled Ashtray 2. Well, there's Ashtray 1, and Ashtray 1 ran into this problem. They successfully made it, you know, into Laos, they inserted, they infiltrated the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they did everything they were supposed to, ambushed a convoy, destroyed numerous trucks, killed many, you know, numerous NVA, but they were not able to keep that truck driver alive. They ended up killing him in the process okay. because that's how chaotic a gunfight is. Sure. So they have to figure out a way to stop that truck without killing the driver. So Plaster, uh, he assembles his team. He starts planning this whole thing out, and he decides he wants to use Claymore Mines to do this. So he he comes up with this way of rigging Claymore Mines. He uses three of them. Okay. He's got you know one pointed straight at. So let's say let's say you were the you were the truck the front tire of this truck. Okay. He's got one pointed directly at you right here, and then off to each flank he's got uh, a Claymore Mine canted in towards it as well. Right, so it almost almost like an open C, um, and that's what he would use to blow that front tire out of commission. Right, hopefully not kill the driver, and uh, he and his recon team will practice this. They'll spend three weeks nonstop prepping for this mission. Right. They'll they'll practice for every direction that the truck could possibly come from. Dry runs, different times of day. They'll practice it at daytime, nighttime, dusk, dawn. They experiment with all different kind of demolition charges before they settle on the the, the Claymore mine setup. But they'll even do a two-day reconnaissance of their egress route just to make sure that when they're extracting, they're not going to run into any uh, hidden NVA camps. You know, some some NVA unit had just come back across the border and it's taken a little R&R after some mm -hmm. fighting in South Vietnam and then stumble upon them when they're trying to get out of their hurry, in a hurry. Um, they do all of this. They, they really, they really, I mean, the preparation, it's, you know, you and I know the kind of preparation that goes into a big mission, yes. but to think about, to think about these guys in this era with the tools and everything they had at their disposal, how much planning they're putting into this is, is truly unbelievable. Like doing your homework times a million. Right, right. So needless to say, they get ready, they do their recon, and then they go. Uh, he and his 12-man team are going to be inserted on March 27th, 1970, uh, and they'll be about three clicks from the Ho Chi Minh Trail, from their objective, and it will take them three days to move that three kilometers. Wow. So I, I was watching an uh, interview with John Plaster, and he said, um, he said there'd be entire days where you might only move 500 meters in Just the entire day. Can't be seen you or move heard that or slow. anything. Yeah. Well, again, you have you have the counter recon teams that are out there, like the hunter killer teams that are searching these guys out. You yeah. have all the NVA patrols. You have the troops moving up and down the the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The NVA troop strength in this area is is absurd. I don't know if I can stress that enough. Right. Um, but needless to say, three days they make it there, and so just like you and I have fives and twenty fives, mm -hmm. uh, and and. Will you explain to the viewers what fives and twenty fives are? Yeah, so fives and twenty fives when you're mounted in trucks, it's gonna be the guy in back or gib is gonna jump out, truck stops, convoy stops, whatever the case it is. You get out and you check your immediate surroundings, your five meter surroundings. You look down at the ground where you're about to step and you look around the truck five meters, and then once you realize that's clear, there's no threat, there's no IEDs, there's no bombs, there's no nothing that's gonna kill you or your team. Then you branch out to 25 meters, so fives and 25s, so you're doing the search that way, you're doing the search that way, they're doing the search on the other side, five meters and 25 meters around, so then you realize what around you is should be a, should secure enough that you wouldn't uh, miss anything, so that's what the fives and 25s are for. Right, so, well, like we had fives and 25s, they had their 10 and 10s, so they'd walk 10 steps, wait 10 minutes. Uh, that's why it's taken them oh, so wow. long to get there. And they're also sterilizing their back trail. And yeah. what I mean by sterilizing their back trail is they're covering up any sign that they had walked through there. They're covering their tracks, any broken twigs. Whoever's walking tail end Charlie's really got to be on point. You know, like they've got 
I don't mean be on point. I mean <laughs> I <gotcha>. mentally be <laughs> on point um, because uh, because it's life and death, right? If you, if you mess up covering up that back trail, sterilizing your back trail, there's numerous recon teams. You know, the entire team will be wiped out yeah. and never heard from again because of because of not covering up their their back trail. Yeah. But they finally make it, and they get within a hundred meters of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Plaster is going to have his guys circle up into a little rally point base base area there. Mm. They'll drop their packs there. Um, the radio will be left there along with the the team medic. And Plaster and a few other guys move up closer to the road to start observing it and, and really kind of pinpoint where they want their ambush site to be. Well, around 7 p.m., they're on the road. They're watching. They think they have their ambush site selected. It's still light outside. And Plaster uh, watches an NVA truck drive past him. And he knows, all right. We're getting, we're getting close. We better start getting ready for this thing. If there's one, there's two. Yep, yep. He lets this convoy pass him by, but he knows now they're going to start having traffic flow through here. Um, I guess at the time, the NVA were very strategic about when they would start moving convoys because of, because of the B-52 bombing campaigns. <coughs> so a lot of the time it would be done at night or when air crews were changing over or, or dinner time or something like that. They were very strategic about that. But Plaster knows we got we to gotta start setting this thing up. So once this convoy passes him, Plaster crawls out into the road, out actually onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So there is one big rule that I have gathered from listening to all these guys. It's a rule that you and I have been taught, too, and we weren't even on a recon team. Mm. But it's stay off of the road. Right, right? Right, right. If you're patrolling, you're doing anything like that, don't use the roads. You, like, take the harder route to walk. It'll save your life. Yep. And yep. and th- that's no different for them either, right? Like, that's their first rule. You don't use trails. You don't use roads. Well, John Plaster, he has to get he out on the road. Because if he does it from the bush, like, if he doesn't get it all the way on the road, that claymore is not going to be strong enough to take out that front wheel. Right. So he has to get it out on the road a little bit and then camouflage it as best he can. Um, he does that. He gets out there, puts this, puts the clay, the three claymores in, and then uh, starts positioning his men. So it'll be him and three other guys that'll be in the actual ambush party, right? Okay. Uh, the rest of the 12-man team will be split up into two elements. One element will be pushed about 100 meters down down to Plaster's right from where from the ambush site. The other team will be about 100 meters down to the left from Plaster's ambush site. And their goal is to keep any reinforcements or reactionary force um, from approaching the sound of this ambush, right? If they're hitting the first truck, they don't gotcha. know which way it might come from. So he has he has them out there on both sides. But they hit this first truck. Everybody else in the convoy is going to have to stop. They're going to hear what's going on. They're going to get out and come up to try to help. Yeah. Those those teams are put in place to make sure you can delay them a little bit to give that ambush team enough time to get that driver Smash out of the guy. truck. Wow. Well, I mean, d- dude, I'm <clears throat> telling you, these guys had everything thought of, everything thought of. So once he gets everybody set in, everybody's in their position, sun's going down, it's it's dark now, and at around 10 p.m., Plaster can hear the engine of an NVA truck approaching. All right. I mean, dude, you talk about your heart rate just starting to jack up. Yep. I can feel it, and I'm not even there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, whoo, man, <laughs> intense. And, uh, and they hear it coming. It's getting louder and louder. Now, Plaster knew it being dark and how dark it would be in the jungle that he'd have to have some way to aim the claymores. He wouldn't be able to see the claymores anymore, but he had to be able to have some way to aim those claymores to hit that front wheel. So what he had done while picking the ambush site, he made sure that he lined those claymores up directly across from a specific tree, and he would use that tree as an aiming point. He would lay down behind the claymores a little further, you know, a little further back into the bush, mm-hmm. and as that truck's wheel broke his sight line of that tree, he knew he could clack that claymore off yep. and he'd be on target. Well, he's laying there waiting, laying there waiting. Here comes the truck and it breaks that, you know, breaks his sight line for that tree, clacks it off, boom, and it stops the truck. Nice. The ambush team hops out and immediately gets to work. Two guys go directly for the driver. They extract him, get him in flexi cuffs or something like flexi cuffs. Mm. Um, one guy goes to the passenger side 
to, to handle any um, any front cab passengers in case there's any kind of resistance or somebody else in the truck, which there wasn't. And then Plaster checks the back of the truck, right? Okay. He moves to the, the end of the, the back end of the truck to check, make sure there's no troops back there. Um, they get this guy wrapped up. Plaster throws a, uh, a satchel charge into the truck and then a thermite grenade on the hood of the truck and signals uh, the egress, you know, sig- signals to withdraw. And okay. this is where things start getting crazy for them. So up until this point, they've been in control of everything. There's, there's, they've had no hiccups from the enemy, but Plaster yells out twice as loud as he can, withdraw, withdraw, to follow that up and to make sure everybody could hear mm-hmm. his order to withdraw. Because remember, he's got a guy, he's got guys 100 yards or 100 meters to his right, 100 meters to his left as well. In the jungle, things don't travel that well. It, yeah. it, the, the, a lot of sound gets killed in the jungle because it's thick, <laughs> you right. know? Especially if there's um, a, any contact, too. Like, right, right. So, uh, so Plast, one of Plaster's fellow Americans on the team starts, uh, knows to blow a whistle to echo that command, right? Uh, Two blows on a whistle. Man. That's the signal to withdraw for people that couldn't hear the verbal command. This withdraw. guy's got everything planned out. Everything. Double, triple redundancy. It gets more. They, they, it gets more than that. But we're going to get into it. But, but they do. They have it all planned out. Well, that guy blows twice on the whistle. Somewhere very close in the woods was an NVA soldier that no one could, no one saw, no one could account for, the and the guy popped off two, two AK rounds and ended up shooting the American that blew the whistle through both forearms. What? Both. Boom, boom. So now they got a wounded American. They've got their prisoner that they've just extracted, and the NVA know they're there. Well, now that withdrawal's been signaled, the two. Uh, security elements have a specific role they play as well. In each one of those security elements, they have a uh, M79 thumper, a grenade launcher. You know, the, if you guys have seen them, they're, they're the breech loading yep. uh, grenade launchers. They're super cool looking. Well, they had been given very strict orders that when they heard the whistle blow, they would fire three rounds immediately with that M79. And the goal is to shoot it as far as they can down their side of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? The first one would be an HE round. Mm followed by two CS gas rounds, and that's to delay any kind of reactionary force coming up, and then they would start moving back. Um, Throughout this time as well, they have also put in numerous time-delayed grenades, claymores, different mines, all over the place. These two two security elements have. This whole time they've been emplacing them. They start setting the fuses on these things so that as they get back to the rally point and then start to egress to their extraction point, those things will go off for about 45 minutes randomly, confusing the NVA, killing a lot of the NVA. Um, I mean, they do, they have all this planned out to a T, but Plaster's got a problem because he's counting on speed at this point, up to this point with, before he took that, uh, before he had a a wounded American, you know, he could rely on the fact that the, the slowest thing they would have to deal with is their prisoner, right? Well, now he's got, a very badly wounded soldier and the prisoner. So Plaster yeah. ends up staying with the vehicles to hold off any kind of NVA pursuit by himself. Once the guy escorting the, the uh, enemy prisoner of war and the wounded American get back to the rally point, the doc there tries to treat the American as best he can. Somehow he ends up like slinging his arms into his shirt somehow to keep him upright. Yeah. But the guy that's wounded now this is savage dude he denies morphine he's worried that it'll make him too slow and get the team killed wow he's just gonna put up with the pain until you get out of there yeah dude i mean savage because that that would freaking hurt if anybody is not aware what an ak-47 round does to bone it destroys it i mean we have a buddy i have we have a a mutual friend um from the sniper platoon we were there for a few weeks he got shot in the wrist he was having surgery on that wrist for years yep. after the fact. Told, he still he can't. Me, he still can't use some of his fingers. Told me it hurts so bad. Yeah, man, it's, it's just terrible. And this guy's got both forearms all like that. And he's like, "Nah, don't give me the morphine. I'll be too slow." Just savage, savage. Just hammer it out till you get to the end. Well, eventually, Plaster extracts back to the rally point and links up with his team. Now they got to get to their extraction point, right? They're not going to like bed down there for the night. The NVA are looking for them. They got to get out of there. They got to yeah. beat feet. But it's pitch black dark. You got a severely wounded guy. 
and they got a prisoner that's probably not cooperating that much, <laughs> you know. Um, Knock but, him out. But somehow, running throughout the entire night without stopping, um, they they are able to evade the NVA. They get back to their extraction point and they're safely extracted. And nice. uh, and 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 mission success. Success, man. dude. Yeah. I mean, it's like it. It just seems to me like. As much planning that goes into that too, it seems like they're just flying by the seat of their pants, and like they're like, it's prior planning and and uh, experience that really saves the day. But it does seem like there's so much luck involved oh, with it too, man. Yeah, you know, because so many things could have gone wrong. Um, but John Plaster, guy's a legend, man. I I highly recommend uh, everybody looking into that. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. One thing I do want to uh, talk about. Uh, cover while we're talking about John Plaster. Um, I said he'd spent three years with SOG. Two of those years were on a recon team. That's when he did his 22 recon missions. His last year, he got he got injured shortly after this and wasn't able to do recon missions anymore. So his okay. last year with SOG, he was actually a, what they call a Covey, a Covey rider. Covey? Covey, C-O-V-E-Y. Okay. And what a Covey rider is, is... Um, Flying in something that resembles like a Cessna almost, a single prop plane that can fly at a high altitude. Yeah. You'd have Air Force Fax, uh, forward air controllers. And a Covey rider was always an experienced recon guy that would ride in the plane with the FAC, and he would manage the radios. So he would manage the inf uh, infill and extract for the teams. He would organize and um, organize and uh, you know, employ... Uh, close air support, artillery support, uh, Kazavaks. He was basically the quarterback up in the air. So it's right? like what a satellite would do today. Right, but it, but back then it. it's a Covey pilot. Because here's the deal. These guys are operating so deep into Laos and Cambodia. Yeah. They can't, they don't have radio signals that will reach South Vietnam, especially over all those mountains and stuff. Makes so sense. they have to have either a Covey, a Covey rider and a FAC pilot relay their, their, their comms back to you know the COC, mm. or they have to have a radio relay station. And there's a few of those, but there's not that many because they have to be a permanent installation in Laos. There's MSS Leghorn is one that's kind of popular now, you know, uh, after the fact. But, um, but again, you have to be in a very specific area to reach those, and yeah. there's not that many of them. So Covey Covey riders were the ones, right? I they like they, they were the it. ones that were uh, that were awesome. And if you guys are interested and want to look into this more, John Plaster actually. Um, while he was a Covey rider, had two what they call prairie fire situations happen. A prairie fire situation is like, like Alamo, at, like this is it. This is this is it's it's a this is a broken arrow situation, right? Okay. This is as bad as it gets. Yeah, we're surrounded. We're almost overrun. We need everything. Well, he had two of those happen simultaneously while he was a Covey rider, and someone back in the COC recorded it. There's an audio recording. So you can hear the guys on the ground. You can hear the helo pilots. You no can hear kidding. the gun, like all, everything. And then you can hear Plaster or like directing Just everybody. Doing his thing. And it's uh, being awesome. It's nuts, man. It's nuts. So if you're interested, look up look up John Plaster, um, his recording as a uh, Covey writer. It's it's I'm phenomenal. Listen to that too. Um, now, last thing on him, before he would leave Sog, Plaster would complete more than 350 aerial combat missions as a Covey writer within a year. That's like being in the air for a whole, whole year. Yeah, almost every day. Almost every day, just being in the air. Guy's wow. a savage. That is a lot of air time. 